So let's continue on. So we now want to see what definition of an upper Riemann sum and a lower Riemann sum is. So we've now got some fixed dissection, which we'll call D. And let's say our dissection D splits the closed interval AB into little n pieces. So we're now going to define what the upper Riemann sum is over our dissection D of our initial function F. So this is defined to be the sum from i is equal to 1 to n of xi minus xi minus 1. And don't worry, I will explain in just a moment what this actually means. Times the supremum of x is an element of the interval xi minus 1 to xi of the value of f of x. So let's draw a picture and explore what this means. So we'll draw the picture of our function f again. So these are the axes. This is our closed interval a, b. And then here is our function f over that interval. And now we've got some dissection. And just for simplicity, let's, for our picture, just have our dissection really simple. Let's just split it up into three pieces. So n is going to be 3 in this case, and x0 is a, x3 is b, and then we've got these two cuts inside, one at point which we'll call x1, and the other at point x2. So in the case of our picture, our upper Riemann sum over this dissection of our function f is going to be the sum from i is equal to 1 to 3 of, and then it's the difference between xi and xi minus 1 times then this supremum. We'll ignore that bit for the moment. Let's just look at this bit firstly here. If we actually write this out, so get rid of the sigma notation, which is quite scary, and we're going to have the first one is going to be x1 minus x0, and then times something which we've missed for now. Then the next one is going to be plus i is equal to 2, x2 minus, oops, I've put an i there, it's supposed to just be a 1, minus x1. And then finally, when i is 3, it's going to be x3 minus x2. So actually, what those things are in this part of the Riemann sum, they're just the lengths of these intervals that we partitioned are overall interval into. So this one here is that length there, this one here is that length there, and this one here is that length there. And more generally, when you've got a general dissection, that remains the case. These, this bit here in the Riemann sum, that's just the length of all of the intervals that you have partitioned your overall interval a, b into. Now let's think about that other bit, the supremum over x is an element of the interval xi minus 1 to xi of the value of f of x. So again, let's now write that out for our dissection into three pieces here. So here we're going to have the supremum over x is an element of x what? Oh, sorry, x0 it should be, to x1 of f of x. Here we're going to have the supremum for x is an element of x1 to x2 of f of x. And here we're going to have the supremum for x is an element of x2 to x3 of f of x. Now, in order for us to be able to do upper Riemann sums, we need the function to be bounded above, and the same is going to hold true in reverse for lower Riemann sums. We're going to need it to be bounded below. So actually, it turns out that in order for our Darbo, or indeed for our Riemann integral to be defined, a condition that the function is going to have to have is it's going to have to be bounded above and below on the interval. So that's a condition that I'm now going to insist on for this function. So 
bounded above means that there is some capital U is an element of the real line such that um, f of x is less than or equal to capital U for all x is an element of the closed interval AB. And then the other way round for bounded below, there is a lower bound which we could call L, a capital L, such that it's less than or equal to f of x for all x is an element of the closed interval AB. So I'm going to insist that our function is going to be bounded. That's necessary in order for it to be Riemann integrable over this interval. And indeed, it's necessary even for us to be able to define the upper and the lower Riemann sums. So for us to be able to define the upper Riemann sum, it needs to be bounded above. And for us to be able to define the lower Riemann sum, it needs to be bounded below. And you see, if it isn't bounded above, we're going to have a problem here um, when we're trying to do this upper Riemann sum. And I'll explain exactly why that is and once I've just explained what this means here. So let's, let's look at this. So let's start with this one here. So we're taking the length of this interval here and then we're taking the supremum for x is an element of x0, x1. So x is allowed to be in that interval and then you're taking the supremum of the values of f of x. Now the concept of the supremum here is the bit that makes this a little bit more tricky, makes it a little bit more subtle. So in the case of our picture, here is our interval x0 to x1, and I have drawn the function over this interval as being continuous. Now, for continuous functions over a closed interval, by the extreme value theorem, that function will obtain its maximum and minimum. So the supremum of all the values of the function over this interval is actually going to be equal to its maximum. So on this picture, let's just draw some dashed lines. Here's the dashed line at x1. Here's the dashed line at x0. This value here, this is the maximum value, and that's going to be the supremum. So the supremum is equal to the maximum in this case that the function actually does obtain its maximum. So that value here, that's what we're going to be multiplying by the length of the interval here. So you can see that what we're going to get there is the area of this rectangle that I'm going to draw in red here. That is what this term of the upper Riemann sum is equal to. Now, it is important that we don't just put max there, that it does need to be the supremum, because in more general functions, it might not be the case that the function actually obtains its maximum over this, val over this interval x0 to x1. However, it will be bounded over that interval because it's bounded over the entire interval AB. That's a criterion that I've now put. So it will have an upper bound. And therefore, if I were to collect all the values of f of x into a set, so I could actually write that out. So I could make the set of all values of f of x where x is allowed to vary over this interval x0 to x1. If I make that set, that will be a set that is bounded above by that upper bound for the function, that big U. And therefore, it's going to have a supremum by the least upper bound axiom. So there will be a supremum. But in more general cases, there might not necessarily be a maximum. If we put maximum here, we would have to have more conditions on the function f. So to keep our definition powerful, we want to keep it as general as possible so that it can handle as many functions as possible. So that's the reason that we want this subtler concept of the supremum, which is guaranteed to exist as long as the function is bounded above. Now, if we considered a function that wasn't bounded above over the closed interval a, b, then it would have to be the case that for any dissection in at least one of the intervals that has been cut up, in one of the pieces that we've got here, it must be the case that the function is unbounded in at least one of them. Because if it was bounded in all of them, then it would be bounded over the entire interval. So if it's not bounded over the entire interval, then it, in at least one of the cut up pieces, it must then be unbounded. And then one of these suprema wouldn't exist. So that's the reason that to define this upper Riemann sum over a dissection, it must be the case that the function has to be bounded above 
over the closed interval AB. And as we'll see, for it to be Riemann integrable, we need the upper Riemann sums and the lower Riemann sums to be defined. And for the lower Riemann sums to be defined, we're going to need for it to be bounded below. So that's why I've put that condition on that the function is going to be overall bounded in order for us to be able to do this definition of Riemann integrable. So let's continue that on. So now let's look at this bit here. So we've got the length of the interval x1, x2 here. And then again, we're taking the supremum of the value of f of x over that interval. Subtler than the maximum, but in the case of this picture, the function does actually obtain a maximum, and therefore it is just going to be the maximum in this case. So the maximum is pretty much the same as the maximum for this first interval. It's up here. So again, sketching in red here, that term of the sum is going to be the area of that rectangle. And in fact, I should have probably done it in a different colour. Let's do it in green, like so. So that rectangle in green, that's that second part of the Riemann sum, the upper Riemann sum. And then finally, it works the same for the final bit. So x2 to x3 is that length there. Again, we're taking the supremum of the value of f of x over the interval x2 to x3. So in the case of our picture, again, there's a maximum value. So that will be the supremum in this case. So it's like that. And the area of that rectangle is what's represented here. So that is what this upper Riemann sum is capturing. If, you're, if you take a dissection, and I might just draw another picture with a more general dissection now. So if we repeat our picture, and I'll try and draw it larger this time. So if we have our function here, here's our interval a, b. Take a general dissection, and it could have a huge number of points. You know, n could be 1 million. You could have divided it up into a really fine dissection. So you could have a really fine dissection like so. And in this sum, each of these is going to be the length of the intervals that the dissection has cut the overall interval into. And then you're multiplying each one by the supremum of the values of the function over that interval. So for this first one here, again, in the case of this picture, I've drawn a nice continuous function. So it's actually obtaining its maximum and minimum over that interval. So the supremum is going to be the maximum. So it's going to be the area of that rectangle. That's going to be the i is equal to 1 term. It's going to be the area of that rectangle. For the next interval along, that's when i is equal to 2. Again, you'll have the horizontal length of the rectangle. And then you'll be going to the maximum value of the function over that interval, which will be up here. Let's try and add that onto the picture. Like so. And you'll be taking the area of that rectangle by multiplying x2 minus x1 by the supremum of the value of f of x over the interval x1 to x2, and adding that on. So overall, when you add up all the areas of these rectangles, so you'll go right to the final one, the final little part of the... Oh, that's not a very not well-drawn line. Let me rub that out. So you'll go right the way up to this final part of the dissection here, this final interval in the partition that the dissection has produced. And you'll be taking its maximum value again, or its supremum more generally, but in the case of this picture, the supremum is the maximum value, which is up here. And then by multiplying those two things together, you'll get the area of that rectangle. So you, hopefully you can see intuitively that these upper Riemann sums are always going to be bigger than the area under the curve. So we could use an upper Riemann sum as an approximation for the area under the curve, but it's always going to overestimate in the case of a positive function. And also in the case of a negative function. So if we think about what an upper Riemann sum is going to be doing for a negative function, so let's now have our function below the x-axis. So let's consider something like this over the closed interval a, b. And for simplicity, we'll just take a easy dissection where we're just splitting it up into three parts again. 
then if we consider what the upper Riemann sum for this function is going to be, well, we know the area under the curve is going to come out as a negative number from calculus. That's what we want it to do. Then if we think about what the upper Riemann sum is going to be over this dissection, so for this first interval, interval x0 to x1, we will take the length of that interval and we'll multiply it by the supremum of the value of the function over that interval. Now, the supremum is going to be the, the least upper bound, so it's going to be, in this case, the uh, largest value again, but that means the value that's least negative, so it's the smallest modulus value. So it's this value here. So actually, you'll be multiplying the length of the interval by that negative number and getting that negative area that you'll be adding on. And then for the next one, again, you'll have the supremum, which will actually be the smallest modulus number now, rather than the maximum modulus number, as it would have been in the positive case. So that's roughly that. So you'll be adding on that area here. And then for the final one, again, the minimum is roughly there. So you'll be getting the least negative answer here. Um, so because the area under the curve overall comes back as a negative number in the case of these negative functions, in the case of the upper Riemann sums now, it is going to be giving the most positive possible answer. It's going to be overestimating again. Um, it will give an answer that is more positive than the actual answer of the area, which is the same as for the positive case. So here it was giving an answer that was above, greater than the actual area. And here again, it's going to be giving an answer that is greater than or equal to. And I should state that. So an upper Riemann sum could give an answer that is actually equal to the area under the curve. Hopefully you can uh, realize what function that's actually going to occur for. So if you've got a constant function, then an upper Riemann sum will actually equal the value of the area under the curve. So if we've got a function like that, and we had the interval a, b, no matter what dissection we take, and again, just for simplicity, we'll take a dissection just up into three pieces, then if we consider the upper Riemann sum, well, the supremum is just the one value that it takes, this constant value, which we can call k. So when we do the upper Riemann sum, we're going to take the length here, multiply it by k, the length here, multiply it by k, the length here, multiply it by k, which will obviously actually give you the answer of the area under the curve. So upper Riemann sums, the answer is always going to come out greater than or equal to the actual area under the curve. So if we call the area under the curve A, then if we have an upper Riemann sum over any dissection you like of the function F, it's always guaranteed to be greater than or equal to the value of that A.